Ben Woodruff here with another falconry video. Uh, today's video I'm excited about. This is one I've been putting off for a while, but some of you have requested this subject, so I'm excited to address it. Today's video is an intro to jeer falcons. One of my favorite species to fly uh, and one of the most rewarding species to fly if you do it right. So first I want to talk a little bit about them as a species, kind of an intro that way, and then talk about them as a falconry bird and hunting. So jeer falcons are circumpolar, meaning they live at the northern part of the northern hemisphere. So even though that spans multiple countries, circumpolar is still one region. In some countries like North America, you know, in Canada, United States, where I live, they will range further south, and in other countries, they're stricter to be up far north, but it's still a circumpolar region. They are the largest falcon in the world by, by quite a bit. Their closest cousin, the Saker falcon, has a pretty wide range and is more of a desert to high desert species. Where their range overlaps in Siberia and Asia, they will interbreed uh, quite regularly. Not just a Saker falcon and a Jeer falcon find each other. There's hybrids and tribrids, and uh, you might have one sixteenth Jeer and be the rest Saker. So that's something going on. Uh, sometimes that is referred to as an Alti falcon, although others consider the Alti Saker to be its own bird. But it's interesting to know that these two close cousins do interbreed in the wild. But a Jeer falcon is still substantially larger than even the largest Saker falcon. The species is very striking in coloration. They can be pure white to pure black to any shade of gray in between. And of course, as you would imagine in a species that ranges in so many countries, there is, is a diverse mix of patterns within that. Now, <clears throat> even though the markings will change, some are white from the time they have their first year feathers and when they molt into adults their second years, they're white with different patterns and same thing. The black ones usually are very black and then their second year, they're sort of a, a slaty grayish back, black on their head and back and their chest is sort of a bluish gray, almost like some of the peregrines. And <clears throat> there's some, many of the ones I've flown, like some of the silver jeer falcons, they start off quite brown and then their second year become white and silver. It's generally been said that the whiter the jeer falcon, the more, typically they're more northern, and they are more susceptible to asper spores. Aspers are these spores that are everywhere in the air, and if they get lodged and take root in the lungs and respiratory tract of a bird, the bird can get aspergillosis and die quickly. So having a, uh, a, a, an area that is clean of spores and, and, and wetness and mold is very important to upkeep any bird, but especially a jeer falcon that is quite white. In the wild, like most large falcons, jeer falcons are traditionally bird hunters. There's a lot of them that are coastal that hunt water birds, seabirds, uh, a lot of ducks and a lot of geese, but uh, they do also hunt arctic hares and lemmings and arctic ground squirrels. They are opportunistic, especially during the baby season when they have a nest full of young that they need to raise. Because they are arctic, their toes are shorter for their body size than you would expect. They're still incredibly powerful with their grip, but they do have shorter toes. They also have shorter legs. We believe that both of these are an adaptation for the cold. Longer and you have skinny toes that are uncovered away from your heart, the more work it is for your pulmonary system and the easier it is to get frostbite. So again, the shorter and stumpier things are, the closer you can keep them to you, the warmer you can be. So that is our belief as to why, for their size, cheer falcons have proportionately shorter toes and legs. In some that I have flown, the bare part of their legs are so short that I've had to design special anklets that are rolled on both sides so, that, cause, so they're strong enough for the bird, but narrow enough to not uh, be affecting the feathers on the higher part of the leg. Some jeer falcons have feathers between their toes. And again, we think that this is something, you know, adaptation in action where there's a little bit of favor if you have slightly feathered toes that you're going to keep warmer. I don't see it all that often, but two of my jeer falcons have had feathers in between their toes. Kind of unique. Now, they are generally considered to be the fastest animal on earth in level travel. 
Now, all falcons can dive incredibly fast. Typically, we say that the peregrine falcon is the fastest animal on Earth, and it can dive faster than any other bird. But in level flight, chasing, we I've heard quotes anywhere from 90 miles an hour to 140 miles an hour. I've never sat there clocking a jeer falcon in level flight. But it is generally accepted to be the fastest animal on Earth in level travel. Jeer falcons have a long and a rich history in the sport of falconry. They have been prized since ancient times. Uh, the earliest, actually, that we have documented are uh, about 7,000 years ago in Alaska. We have, uh, there was a, a, an ancient village that has been excavated by archaeologists, and we found adult jeer falcons that were kept well and healthy that were buried. We don't know if they were for food, if they, if this was a ritual keeping or even a pet, but it seems strange that you would keep something as a pet where food is scarce in Arctic climate. But all throughout uh, the Middle East and in medieval times and the Renaissance, jeer falcons were highly prized. It used to be that expeditions would set forth uh, during medieval times from Denmark to Greenland is quite a journey considering the the boat technology of that era to get jeer falcons to bring back to Europe for the royalty of Europe. It was an arduous journey and people died on these trips and they would always say that a jeer falcon is worth a king's ransom and there are even instances where uh, you would have somebody held for ransom like a prince and the enemies would say okay we want the king's white jeer falcons in trade. So it's rather, rather interesting that history. There's also a time where <clears throat> during medieval times, falcons were brought to church by nobility. It became the proper fun thing to do. And I think it's probably more exciting than more church services if you have your birds sitting there with you. And apparently a lot of the uh, priests complained of this. They said, people are bringing birds to church. It's not fair, they're making a mess and being very distracting and disrespectful. So they wrote a letter to the Pope saying, hey, can you please make a, an official decree banning this? And the Pope said, no, sorry, I have my own jeer falcons and I typically have them with me when I do worship services on the Sabbath. So instead he made a decree <clears throat> that allowed bishops and priests and altar boys to have goshawks or sparrowhawks and they could even have them with them at church. So it's kind of a fun little bit of history there. So part of the reason they were so popular in Europe was not for their hunting ability, but because they're gigantic compared to other birds. So I'm sure it was a sort of a status symbol. Their appearance is striking. If you have a white jeer falcon, it's, whoa, it's just glowing. And back then they were quite rare to obtain. You know, if it took people going on ship from Denmark to Greenland, that's, that's a lot of work. So it's understandable that they were sort of a status symbol in falconry throughout the medieval and the renaissance times. So that is just a little brief uh, bit on sort of the biology and the history of jeer falcons. So now I want to talk to you about their use as an actual hunting companion. So as a falconry bird, what are they really like? What's it like to train them and keep them? Well, my first thing I've got to say about that is uh, they are, they are more readily available than they used to be because they're bred in captivity all over the world. Many countries breed them. So uh, they're, they're not particularly rare in the wild, but where they live, people don't live. And uh, with laws and things, it, it's easier to get a captive bred bird from your own country. But they're expensive still. Even though they're readily available, they are quite pricey typically. So that alone keeps a lot of people from flying them. And a lot of times people may keep one, fly it for a season, and then use it in a breeding program to make sure the species remains common in captivity and that genetics remain diverse. The species itself, you, it's a species that if you fly it, you should fly it for the love and passion of the species itself. So it's kind of like, for example, I tell people, if you wanted to hunt ducks and pheasants, get a peregrine falcon. They're, they're easier to train, they eat less food, they're less cantankerous, they're more loyal, and the wiring of their brain is closer to that of ours. Like, they seem to understand falconry quicker, the point of it. And so, if that's your goal, I want a game hawk and I want to fly, go get a peregrine. Uh, but, if you, but if you just really love jeers, then that is a good reason. If like, oh, I'm so passionate about the species and its natural history, by all means. That's why I fly them, because I love them. Same thing with golden eagles. Uh, golden, if you're here in America, the few of us who fly golden eagles, we normally hunt jackrabbits. 
If you're going to hunt jackrabbits, get a Harris hawk, get a red-tailed hawk, get a gauze hawk. It's a lot easier. It's a lot less weight on your arm. But if you're just like, wow, I've always been inspired by eagles. I want to fly one. They just, whoa, I want to experience that. And that's a good reason. So deer falcons are not about practicality. They're about uh, the, the love of the bird. They're about the living poetry of the sport. When you are manning your deer falcon and, and you know teaching them to sit on the fist and to if they jump or bait off to get back up, they're different than other birds. They are very similar to golden eagles in that they're one of the only birds that will actively bait towards your face and then swing around. They have this attitude of like, yeah, I'm gonna go fly somewhere. I can take you out on the way. They have this, this tough guy attitude, most of them. And again, th these points I'm bringing up, I understand every bird is different, every situation is different, but I'm, I'm making some broad generalizations that are often true with most year falcons. So if they bait a lot, it may be aggressive towards your face. Something you gotta be aware of if you've flown falcons for years and suddenly, oh, it's my first year, and then you're like, ah! If they bait away from you, away from a glove, or away from a perch, a lot of times, you were talking a brand new bird here, they jump and you're like, oh, and you go to reach to help them back up and help them learn the process. But you know what? They're smart. I see this is I see this with golden eagles and I see this with jeers and with saker falcons is that as they leap off it's almost like halfway through they remember oh yeah I'm wearing Jess as an unleash and they'll halfway through their bait turn away from you with their so they're facing you you know they were away and now they turn back at you with their feet and if you're going down to help them up gently you might get grabbed or bit they're smarter they're much smarter and more um, keyed in to what's going on around them than a lot of other large falcons. So that's something you need to anticipate if, if you're dealing with them. I don't know why, but for some reason, jeer falcons and saker falcons seem prone to get tangled up. I see this, uh, not, not terribly, but if you're going to have them on a perch, keep an eye on them, keep a good eye on them, because for some reason, I don't know what they do or how they move or what they're thinking, but they might, you know, kind of get a leash a little bit tangled up. So watch for that because that matters. One of the dangers of flying a jeer falcon that's very worrisome is they are more prone to the disease called aspergillosis. There are these little spores everywhere. Right now, I'm breathing them in. They're all over the place, asper spores. Certain conditions uh, concentrate these more, such as a, a wet environment, like if you sprayed down a mew and it didn't dry out adequately, or a travel box, if it's wet, uh, these spores can grow. If it lodges in the respiratory tract of any bird of prey, it can potentially, if they're not exercising enough, inhaling, exhaling enough, it can cause the disease aspergillosis, which moves quickly and can kill them. It's very tragic. Jeer falcons are more prone to this than other birds of prey, and white jeer falcons seem to be the most prone to this disease of the jeers. That could be tragic. You save money, you buy a captive bred jeer falcon that's very expensive, thousands of dollars, you get this bird, you're excited, and because you're not smart about your upkeep, your bird dies of aspergillosis. You don't want that to happen under any circumstances. So just be aware if you're thinking of a jeer, aspergillosis is a factor. So is overheating. It can be, uh, jeers are pretty good once they understand it's hot, if you have a good shaded mew. Uh, what, it, it, some of my jeers I've had indoors in the summer with air conditioning going. Some that were a little more, uh, depending on where I lived and what my mew setup was, I'll have bare minimum a fan outside to keep air circulation going. And every day I will freeze a giant block of ice or buy one from the gas station and I will put it next to their perch so they can land and just stand barefoot on this block of ice and they melt down into it. They love it, they love it. You gotta have good clean water every day for them so that they can bathe and that giant block of ice makes a big difference to help them get through the summer. Now, jeer falcons are intelligent and independent minded. They have a fiercely independent species where it seems to me most peregrines are like, hey, what do you wanna do? I want you to go up a thousand feet. Okay, where jeer falcons are just like, like what, you exist human? Uh, okay, why should I listen to you? They're, they're very smart and they are self hunters. You have to factor this in when you're hunting. 
because you might take them out to the field and you're like, oh, there's a pond with some ducks or geese or some pheasants. My dog's pointing, you take off the hood and they might like, I don't know what's going on, even if they're trained and and just go randomly start wandering around looking for whatever they want to hunt. One of the things I do when I first take the hood off is I'll have a little tidbit of food. So the first thing they're like, oh, it's the world's all over the place. Oh, food. <laughs> oh yeah, the human's there. Right, right, right. Okay, I forgot. Okay, that's what we're doing. It's a good little trick to keep them keyed in on you. They are really intelligent to the point that they figure out processes. They figure out training processes quite quickly. So this can cause problems. For example, if, if you're training your deer falcon to wait on and they circle up and you throw up a pigeon and they woo, dive down and try to get it and even if they miss and then you call them back over to the lure, they might learn, hmm, I didn't catch the pigeon. All I have to do is do a little bit of a chase and they're going to bring out the lure and take me home and feed me. So why go up high? I'll conserve my energy. I'll just fly 70 feet in circles and eventually this person's going to throw out the lure and give me food. So that's just an example. There's countless examples with your falcons like that where they figure out your process too quickly so you need to anticipate ahead of time that a lot of the training techniques we use on falcons you have to be more subtle and nuanced with and you have to problem solve all the time with them where a, a peregrine falcon once it's got a good system down, most peregrines are pretty good to just, hey, I'm going to do the same thing. You give me the same scenario, I'm going to be loyal. Jeer falcons are more like other birds of prey where you're constantly rethinking, constantly adjusting the weight management and the training techniques. You're making the lure more or less important. You're making, you're feeding them more or less off of a kill they make based off of, the, off of what they're doing. You have to keep doing this the whole time that you have them. Now, jeer falcons are tail chasers, which means they love to just outrun something for fun. So here's an example. But let's say you have a, 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 your, a peregrine falcon goes up. Here's a duck. A peregrine boom, thumps it. A jeer falcon might do the same thing. But let's say it misses and it's like, cool. And it just starts chasing that duck. And it might be for five miles, seven miles, it just chases them. Now it's fast enough to speed up and grab that duck, but it doesn't. It just chases almost full speed until the duck uh -huh, tuckers out of energy and then they slam into it and carry it to the ground. And they're like, yeah, I got my workout in. Come pick me up, Falconer. Falconer, you're miles away. This can ruin a hunt very quickly for a lot of reasons. You could have a wild hawk or an eagle dive down and kill your jeer falcon while they're sitting there on the duck. Which happens to wild jeers as well, but it's something you have to anticipate. Uh, <clears throat> also, usually you're hunting in the winter time where you have very little sunlight. This is one of the reasons why jeer peregrines are so popular. A male jeer falcon should be the ultimate bird for hunting sage grouse. Uh, but instead, people use jeer peregrines instead of a male jeer because that g male jeer may just chase for miles and by the time you find it, it's night and if you had to fly another bird, you're out of time. So uh, jeer peregrine is a good trade-off where they're a little more loyal, a little less prone to tail chase the way that a jeer falcon will. This brings up the point of telemetry. You, you cannot fly a big falcon without telemetry without eventually losing it. This is uh, perhaps more true with, an, with a jeer than with any other bird. Bells will not cut it. You have to have the best, most far-ranging telemetry you can use. Now, there's a lot of brands available. I've tried many, and I only use Marshall radio telemetry. Uh, the Power Max is the bare minimum. You need to at least use a Power Max transmitter which is a very far-ranging transmitter they provide. Or they also have GPS transmitters, which I have now switched to. These are crucial. And these have not only helped me found, find my Jeer Falcons when they chase a bird for two miles, but also keeps you from getting your bird eaten. I can't tell you how many times I've saved my Jeer Falcons from getting eaten by an eagle that was flying in and about to get there. And I get there just in the nick of time, thanks to good, far-ranging telemetry. Now, the the first year Jeer Falcons, I if you take a look at my video on 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 discipline and I talk about how you can't discipline them but what things you can do instead. And I mentioned in that video about panic, how a bird it can be thinking 
and then suddenly something can trigger them and they're in panic mode and you can help them calm back down with things like a hood or taking them away from the thing that's scaring them but sometimes a bird can just amp themselves up or panic 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 uh, you know like a dog barks a fire engine comes by and they just bah! and they freak out and you cannot get them to calm down no matter what jeer falcons first year jeer falcons in particular are prone to this click i'm in freak out mode my brain shut off and i cannot calm down and so one of the techniques we will use is to use water and it resets the brain so you take some water in like their bath pan and you you set them in it carefully and gently and you let the underside of their wings and their belly and their feet get wet and you take them out and that ah oh right oh hey yeah how you doing i had a bit of a freak out there sorry it resets their brain and suddenly you have this bird that was screaming and freaking out at everything in the world and suddenly it's it's more relaxed and it's like yeah i'll sit on your fist how you doing you give it some food oh yeah we're friends so that's 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 important to to know that ahead of time and anticipate that again especially some of those first year jeers love to freak out now if you decide you do want to fly a jeer falcon uh, to me, they are the most challenging falcon to fly properly, meaning to get them to the point of being a legitimate game hawk that takes game, and the most rewarding. When you think of the art of falconry, and you think of this as this beautiful art, one of the pinnacles of the poetry of the sport is to have a jeer falcon trained. Now, maybe it took you a couple of years to fully get a good relationship going together. And that jeer falcon now is circling up 2,000 feet. Is this bright white speck in the sky, locks its wings over, and it's like, go ahead. And you flush a sage grouse or a goose or a pheasant or a duck and to watch the largest falcon on earth diving at speeds over 100 miles an hour and just scream down and knock prey out of the sky and then circle back around carry the falling prey to the ground mantle over it and you approach and you yeah you pick them up and trade them off for some food it's falconry of the highest order it really is beautiful when everything comes together i have uh done falconry for many years since back in the 1900s tried a wide range of birds for falconry and for education. And for me nowadays, I find a lot of joy training a, a falcon species that challenges me. It's still fun to fly birds that are easy to, easier to train, and I do that as well. But flying a jeer falcon is something I hope to always do because it is so breathtaking when everything comes together. Well, I hope that this answers some of your questions about flying jeer falcons it's by no means all encompassing but if you have questions down below about jeer falcons that are simple i can answer them down there or if you think you need more info i could even make another video that goes into more depth but i hope you enjoy this uh, please let me know what other videos you would like to see and as always happy hawking